Thank you for joining. If you would like to support this channel, please subscribe. Enjoy the sermon. And praise be to the Lord. Amen. For his unspeakable gift. And for being able to sing the praises of our God and to exalt him today, regardless of the circumstances and the times that we live in. He's a saving God. He's a pain taker. And we rejoice in that this morning. God bless all of you that are here, following all the social distancing spread out everywhere. And for all of those online who are joining us as part of our morning worship today, we greet you. We're so happy to be together with everybody and whatever means that that happens to be. And certainly glad to know the name of the Lord and that it is a strong tower and that we can run into it and be safe. Matter of fact, as I've already run into it. It's not a tower that I can run into. I've already run into it. And so we are safe and secure in our Lord today. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, and if you don't, I encourage you to have them. But turn with me today to the Word of the Lord. The book of Isaiah, chapter 28, is where I want to read a scripture into our hearing and expound on that this morning. It has such great encouragement and spiritual strength for us, and that is my desire and intent and prayer that that will be the outcome and the result of our time spent in the Word of the Lord together today. Isaiah chapter 28 and verse number 16 is where I'm reading, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, and he that believeth shall not make haste. I simply want to spend a few minutes today exhorting to you from this scripture on the subject, a stone to rely on a stone to rely on god bless you those that are here may be seated and if you were standing at home you may be seated there is a proverb that many years i became aware of a biblical proverb found in the book of proverbs that says trust in an unreliable man is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. Anytime we seek to put pressure or depend on something that cannot be trusted or that is not intended to bear the weight of that expectation, we are in for a great disappointment to say the least and furthermore it can be a great difficulty and uncomfortable result. To rely upon something that cannot meet that expectation is a very sad thing indeed. In this particular verse, Isaiah is prophesying and he says to the people of God then and by, by application even to us today, that the Lord would lay in Zion. Zion is another name for Jerusalem the city of God, that he would lay in Zion a foundation stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. And then he said the result of that is that he that believeth shall not make haste. That's not a word that we use frequently today, but it quite simply means that he that believeth in him shall not be in a hurry. And if you've paid any attention to your world lately, you realize that we are in a big hurry. Where we're going, I don't know. But we're in a hurry to get there. The army used to have a little saying that said, hurry up and wait. And have you ever noticed that the more lost you get, the faster you go? Have you ever been lost and not knowing, of course, GPS, but you can't even always trust GPS, and you get sidetracked and you don't know where you are, so you, that sense of panic hits you, and now all of a sudden you, you, you start looking and 
making decisions quick, and you'll either go faster physically or you'll go faster mentally trying to figure out where you are and where you need to go. Our world today is in that kind of atmosphere. They are in a hurry to go wherever. Some people don't even know where that is. They're just in a hurry to get there. But the promise to those who trust in the Lord is, is that they shall not make haste. They shall not need to get in a hurry because what they're depending on is going to provide for them whatever they need whenever the time is right. My mother or my grandmother was on the farm and my mother was raised on the farm as well. And so we would hear that slogan at times when I was a kid. Haste makes waste. Because any time you get in a hurry to do something or you move too quickly, the chances of you making a wrong decision or a bad decision increases exponentially. And when you make that bad decision, then you're going to have to go back and rework something or you're going to be ripped off or you're going to get into something that you didn't want to get in because you didn't take the time to count the cost, to consider all the consequences of a given scenario. But those who believe on the Lord and rely on Him realize that there's no reason to get in a hurry if you'll let God be the one who guides your decisions. So I looked at this verse and I started looking at all the different word studies. He that believeth shall not make haste. And one version says, he that believeth shall not act hastily. One said, he that believeth shall never be shaken. Another one said that he that believeth shall not be stricken with panic. Think about those words. Panic is one thing. Stricken with it is another. It's like you become afflicted with panic. It's like it hits you like a lightning bolt and you have panic. But he that believeth will not be stricken with panic. He that believeth will not, he that believeth will be unshakable. And he that believeth will not be disturbed. Worry is something common to all of us. But worry is not something that Jesus nor the scriptures encourage. Because worry can be a symptom of fear. And so we get really cute with that. And we say, oh, I'm, I'm really not worrying. I'm just concerned. But however you want to break it down, we understand as human beings there are times we forget that we are built on a sure foundation and we let our emotions go out somewhere into outer space and we become disturbed, stricken with panic. We become shaken. But there is a foundation laid by which we can have this kind of confidence and assurance that God is directing our lives, that He has set our course. It's not that we don't make the decisions, but that our decisions are made based upon the foundation upon which we're standing on, and therefore we have hope. In Psalms 118, David said, The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. And this is the Lord's doings, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Isaiah said there's a foundation that's laid in Zion. It's the Lord has done it. But the psalmist says that the, the Lord has done it, but He's done it with something that was rejected by men. It's like the person who all their childhood is always scorned and disdained and never invited into the in crowd, but somewhere when they become adult, the gifting that they have and the talent they have becomes a blessing to everybody, and now all of a sudden friends are coming out of everywhere to welcome this person. That which is rejected, that which was looked at and said, nope, that won't work, nope, we don't want that, is the same thing that God has made the cornerstone. He is speaking here specifically of Jesus Christ, who was the coming Messiah that was rejected when He came to earth. 
But God has made this Lord and Savior that we serve, Jesus Christ, the cornerstone, the foundation of our life, yet it was initially rejected. Say with me for just a little bit this morning as let's look a little deeper into the context of this verse. In Isaiah chapter 28, the prophet is talking to a generation of people who have a certain mindset and a certain look, outlook on God that is not beneficial for them. And the 15th verse, which is the verse preceding my text, in the New Living Translations says this about these people. You boast, we have struck a bargain to cheat death and have made a deal to dodge the grave. The coming destruction can never touch us, for we have built a strong refuge of lies and deception. What the prophet is saying here is that his generation has gotten to a point in their thinking that they feel they can outdo God. They feel they know more than God, and they feel they do not need God. Whether the threat was war, whether the threat was disease, whether the threat was famine, they felt like they had come to a point where they would always be able to overcome it. And I, I certainly appreciate, sincerely, all of the efforts that man is doing today to try to come up with better testing, better protection, vaccines, shots, treatments, medicines, Whatever that we're doing, and every matter of fact, I am absolutely amazed at some of the cleverness, the ingenuity, and the intelligence by which man is approaching this difficulty. It's not the first time that man has done that, and God gives them great ability and strength to do that. So my comments today are not in that regard. But we also have an element of society that feels that man can do this alone. That without the help of God, or without the recognition of God, or without the dependence upon God, that we can completely do anything and everything we need to do to solve our problems, regardless of the magnitude, without ever looking to the Lord. But let us never forget that without Him we can do nothing. And I know as a preacher of the gospel that the world in, as a whole will never ever stand still and say, we need God. But there will be people who know their Lord that will say, we're going to pray and seek God, that He will give the directions that we need. And Isaiah's generation had come to a point that they said, we can cheat death. We can dodge the grave. The coming destruction, it won't touch us because we have made lies and deception our refuge. And unfortunately, there are people today all over the world who are putting their trust and relying with their lives on philosophies and ideas and on science to bring about for them a sense of salvation and security. We are living in a day of great confusion. Fake media is a term that we use. Anybody who knows and is aware of what goes on on the Internet realizes that just because it's on the Internet doesn't mean it's true. Matter of fact, because it's on the Internet may make it less likely to be true in some cases. Do you believe this or do you believe that? And then when people read something on the internet, they talk about it at the workplace and they don't repeat it correctly. And then someone picks that conversation up and they repeat it to somebody at home and then they turn it a little bit and all of a sudden we have people believing all kinds of imaginary facts and details. It is a day of confusion. It is a day of boasting. Have we ever lived in a time where when nobody can know your name, you can get on the internet and become an overnight sensation and have your 15 minutes of fame boasting or bragging about something. Some of the stuff people are boasting and bragging about 
on the internet today is stuff that some of us have been doing all of our lives and never ask anybody to give us any acknowledgement for. But that's the day that we live in. It's a day of false confidence and false security. So I must ask us the question today, what are we building? What are you building with your life? What are we building as a church? What are we building as a society? What are we building together collectively, culturally? What are we building? And then when we decide what we are building, what kind of society, what kind of culture that we want, well, then we must say, what is the foundation of it? Everything has to be based, built, attached to some kind of core beliefs. See, every one of us have a view of life based on several things. <clears throat> Our personal experiences. You feel a certain way, you believe a certain thing because of the experiences you've had. It could be your outlook on life can be as simply explained by just understanding what your childhood was like how you were raised, what values was taught to you in your home, or what lack of values you didn't have in your home, what you may have experienced inside the home, outside of home. There are some people's lives who have been shaped by one or just a few incidents in the schoolroom or as they grew up and as they become an adult. Your, your view of life could be influenced by your health situation or a financial situation, or by a marital failure, or a marital betrayal, and all of these experiences blend in us to where they create ideas and thoughts and ideas that we build the remainder of our life on. Some people base their life upon what they've been taught in school. Some people base their life on what they've been taught from science, whether true or false science. Some people build their lives based upon what they were taught religiously, what they've been taught in school, so forth, unproven or untested theories, and they make total life-changing decisions based upon a variety or a composite of these things. We all see the world and our lives through this lens of experiences <coughs> excuse me, and influences. But as the Germans would say, we are too soon old and too late smart to be able to know if the ideas we're basing our life on are actually proven and if they're true. We have to go on an assumption. We have to trust that what has been put into us or a part of our lives is true. And we take a risk because we've only got one life to live and it so soon will be passed. So God used Isaiah to prophesy and to make the statement that the Lord will lay in Zion a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, and a sure foundation. Let's look at a few of the things that he mentions here in this verse. <coughs> God has placed among us a stone for us to build our lives upon. The stone was not placed here by man. The stone was not placed here by any technology. God himself in his divinity and in his plan and purpose for man has placed a stone, not a literal stone, a figurative stone, a figure of speech, a rock, a stone. We don't use rocks today to build houses. We use concrete, which is another great, wonderful thing that we've done. But in that day, it was a stone. And that stone had to be a tried stone. It had to be tested. It wasn't something that you could just pick up and use. It had to be a tried stone. There are certain kinds of stones that you hit them at the right place and in the right way. They will just crack and fall apart because they cannot bear the weight or the pressure that can be put on them. But God has placed a stone in the earth. He's placed a stone in our understanding. He's making it known to us by the Word of God that there is a stone that we can build our lives on, and it is a tried stone. 
God is never afraid to be tested because the test will always show that He is true. Jesus Christ is that stone that God has put on the earth, in the earth, and presented to us. And Jesus Christ was a tried stone. In Matthew, excuse me, in Luke chapter 4, the gospel writers tell us that Jesus was tried or tested of the devil. After 40 days of neither eating or drinking, the devil came to Jesus in the wilderness and tempted him with three things. He first of all gave him some rocks or smaller stones and said, turn these into bread. Because the scripture said that Messiah would be able to do that. So the devil said to Jesus, perform the miracle that the scriptures say that you can do. So we'll know that you are the Messiah. Trying to appeal to Jesus Christ as a man to either boast or to exalt himself by his own efforts. And Jesus refused. And he said, it is written, Thou shalt not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And he resisted that temptation to elevate himself of his own efforts. And he passed the test. And then the devil said to him, I want you to cast yourself down from this high building. Because again, the scripture said that if you dash your foot against a stone, he will protect you. And Jesus knew what he was trying to do to him, trying to get him to test, to tempt God, to try to prove that God is who he said he was, which would have been a lack of faith. And so Jesus said to him, It is written, Thou shalt serve the Lord thy God. And again the devil took him up another place and showed him all the kingdoms of the world, all of its wealth, all of its power, and said to Jesus Christ, the man Jesus Christ, if you'll just bow down and worship me, I will give you all of these things. And Jesus knew that that was not the way that his father would elevate him. And he said again to the devil, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And after the devil gave him these three temptations... And Jesus resisted every single one of them. Probably temptations that you and I would have not been able to resist. Jesus Christ resisted them because he held on and knew the word of God. He was tried and he passed the test. He didn't pass with a 70. He didn't pass with an 80. He passed with a 100%. He passed the test. And the devil could not get him to break. And so then we come to Luke chapter 20, and there was men who came to Jesus, and they started to test him. And they asked him a question about who should we pay taxes to, trying to get him to say that they shouldn't pay taxes to the government. And Jesus said, look, you'll see the picture of Caesar is on your coinage. So you render unto Caesar what's his, and you render unto God what is his. And they could not trick him into saying something that would ruin his credibility. And then they asked him about the resurrection, and he passed the test. And they asked him questions about marriage, and he passed the test. And the greatest test of all that Jesus Christ passed was when he went to a garden in Gethsemane, and he knew that his time was short. And that he needed to go to Calvary and die for the redemption and the salvation of our lives. And he prayed to the Father, Lord, if this cup, if it be possible that this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And he prayed that prayer three times. And God did not remove the cup. But Jesus had already surrendered himself and said, nevertheless, not my will but thy will be done. And when he went to Calvary's hill and he was crucified on an old rugged cross, one of the last things he said was, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And God had forsaken him as a man at that moment because he represented all of the sins 
and all of the trespasses that are in our lives and that were in our lives. And yet he held true to God and he passed away and was buried in a tomb. But the greatest test that he ever passed was when he arose on that third Sabbath day and the day after the Sabbath and he arose and proclaimed that he was alive forevermore proving that everything he did and everything he stood for and everything that he taught and everything he accomplished it was validated that it was because he was the Son of God that these things were accomplished. No other man in the history of the world has ever been tested so severely. No man in the history of the world has ever come back from the grave by his own power or by his own choice. But Jesus came up out of the grave showing us that he is the stone. He is the man. His teachings, his ways are the foundation by which you and I should build our lives. And if we build our lives on anything less or anything else than Jesus Christ, then we are putting the weight of our lives, we are putting the future of our lives on something that is going to crack, something that's going to settle, something that's going to dissipate, because He is the only sure foundation that you can build your life upon. Now this is not something that Washington, D.C. DC has created. It's not a law that's been passed. It's not something that the Caesars developed that we're built upon. But it's something God has done in the earth when He came as the man Christ Jesus and walked among us and became that which we can build our lives on. <coughs> Secondly, Isaiah said he was a cornerstone. We don't use that term very frequently today because we build a little differently. We have the same concepts, foundations, and uh, buildings that are built have to have the, a foundation that can bear all of the weight. But in those days, a cornerstone was a stone that they put that actually is where two walls join together. For those who are perhaps not in the building trade and not familiar with those terms, Everything, if the corner can start true, everything else can be true, plumb and level from that point on. If that's not set right, then everything else is going to be out of kilter. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ became the cornerstone. In other words, He is a stone that unites. He is a stone that holds together. He is a stone that sets the trajectory of the building and of the life and of our lives. And so it is set there. And then he said, it is a precious cornerstone. It has great value. Preciousness in its value, but preciousness, preciousness also in how that we relate to him. All of us that are here today, and I hope many that hear my voice have the same feeling that I do, that there is nothing more precious in my life than the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a term we don't use frequently, but it is an accurate term to use. He is precious. When I think of Him, I feel a, a, an affection for Him that I can't feel for nobody else. When I think of the circumstances He's brought me through and the valleys in my life and the dark moments, all I can say is He's precious. It was wonderful to have Him in those circumstances. It was comforting to have Him in those circumstances. Matter of fact, it saved my life to have Him in those circumstances. And if you don't know Him that way today, I'm appealing to you that you can know Him as well. Because when you find Him to be the Lord and Savior of your life and you repent of your sins and turn your back on everything you've tried before and you totally rely your whole life, your relationships, your money, your career, your future. You put everything in His hands and say, I can totally trust you with this. You will find Him to be the most precious possession that you have ever had and will ever have because He holds everything together. Don't put these important things in your life in the hands of your spouse. Don't put the salvation of your soul in the hands of your children 
or in the hands of your parents. Put it in the hands of Jesus Christ. And you can know that you are secure and assured when you are in His hands. He is a sure foundation. He is unmovable. And He's able to bear all the weight that you put on Him. There is nothing too big, nothing too bad, nothing too sorrowful, nothing too heavy that Jesus Christ can't bear the weight of. But if you put it on anything else than Him, you will find out that it's sinking sand and an unstable footing. Peter says, Peter took this verse in Isaiah and he put it this way in the New Testament. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Now I will confess to you that I have lived for the Lord for many, many years. And I will confess to you that I have not always been free of acting hastily and being moved and stricken. I've not always been that way because even though I have serve the Lord and committed to Him, there are times that I just don't live up to what He has provided for. But Peter says that it's there for us. And he says, He that believes on Him shall in no means be put to shame. But I can also tell you this, that there are times in my life where I had nowhere to return and I to turn and I rested completely on the Scripture. And I said, God, I'm in this circumstances and I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do and I don't have the strength to do anything if I did know what to do. I am totally at your mercy. And God would get involved. Now, did he wave a magic wand? Did he just speak something and it magically appeared? No. Somewhere along the way as I began to walk and work through the situation and not panic, trusting he was going to see me through, somebody would call me or somebody would say something or somebody would make a decision and not even know why they were making that decision and it would change things and open another door of opportunity or another way for the situation to be resolved that I had nothing to do with. Nobody spoke in tongues. Nobody did a shaky, shaky hallelujah. It was just God unfolding the situation because I stood back and said, I can't do anything and when you can't do nothing just stand and wait on the salvation of the Lord and I stood on the foundation of Jesus Christ and he began to move things were the decisions I had to make yes was I just laying there like comatose and letting God do everything for me no but I was just very carefully trusting in the Lord walking carefully spiritually figuratively and God would open a door or God would allow a decision to be made or something would change and you just keep walking through those circumstances and you realize it's just God taking care of it and then there's times I've looked back and I said if God had not done it that way I would have done it that way and I would have had as we used to say egg on my face I would have eaten a whole lot of crow but God worked out the situation where I didn't get embarrassed, lives didn't get destroyed, people didn't get wounded and offended because if I'd have done it, it'd have been a mess. But God did it. And I'm able to walk through that fiery trial, able to walk through those overflowing waters, I'm talking figuratively, and come through it without having to be embarrassed, without having to make an apology to somebody because God was guiding me and directing me through that situation. He put a sure foundation underneath us that we can walk with confidence and not have to hang our head child of God you've got a foundation underneath you today next time you feel like panic grips your spirit and the next time you feel like oh I gotta make a decision because if I don't this is gonna happen or the world is gonna crash or the sky's gonna fall or whatever terms you put it into just stop for a minute and say I'm standing on the solid rock I'm not gonna do anything hastily I'm not gonna make a quick decision I'm not gonna get impatient because I'm standing on the solid rock and you will experience as I have that God will make a way out of no way that God will see you through every time because the foundation is tried it's been assured and it is a sure foundation that will not be moved 
So he that believeth shall not make haste. He'll be satisfied with what God provides and in the time that God provides it. He that believes in Him will rest upon these promises, not quick to run to and fro, just trying to find an answer in a hurry, because they are assured and convinced that God is going to see them through. And so I preach to you and proclaim to you as I close this message today, there is a stone that you can rely on. There is a figurative stone. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the God-man. He's the perfect man. He's the Savior of the world. And He can be the foundation that you build your life upon. Because the Scriptures tell us that if we build our house on the sand, when the storms come, it won't stand. But if we build it on the rock, when the storms come, it'll stand. You say, I know, that's pretty simple. Yes, the Word of God is designed to be simple. So all of us can understand it. But here's one other simple thing to remember. Not only is it important what you build your life on, but it is important to know you will never avoid the storms. The winds will come, and the rain will come down, and the test of what your life is built upon will come at some point, and sometimes at several times. But if it's built on the rock, your life can be made whole and your life can stand that test. And so we close here in this message by encouraging you, those of you that are here and those that are here by way of internet, build your life on a stone you can rely on. If it's been built in the past on false religion, experiences, testimonials, hearsay, think so's and maybe so's. Let your heart be drawn to the Lord today. Find out in the Scriptures what He has for you. And if you'll put your trust in Him and turn from a world of sin, a life of sin, and if you'll confess and repent of your sins, He is faithful and just. He will forgive you of those sins. There's no, ma there's no penalty you have to pay. There's no great debt you have to do you just simply have to be honest with yourself and say lord i'm a sinner and i ask you to forgive me of of my sins once you've experienced that and you know you felt the love and the compassion of christ then go further and let someone a, a man of god who believes the word of the lord and jesus and in the power of the name of jesus baptize you in water by immersion for the forgiveness of those sins that you've just repented of. And the promise is, He'll fill you with His wonderful gift of His Spirit. The empowerment of the Lord Jesus Christ that takes up residence in our life to give us the strength to live in a world where there is adversity and difficulty and gives us the ability to stay rooted and grounded upon this true foundation. And so as we stand here today in this auditorium and as you center your minds today into the things of God. The music is going to play and those of her here are going to find a place of meditation and prayer to talk to the Lord this morning and draw close to Him. To thank Him for His provision and commit to that provision. And so we invite you today in the remaining moments of this broadcast and of this service, turn your hearts to the Lord and call upon Him with a heart of hunger and honesty, and God will meet you in your situation.